Well, are you guys watching the countdown too? Uh, <clears throat> it all of a sudden got quiet as we started counting down uh, to Sunday school here. Welcome. Uh, good morning. It is good to be with you all. Uh, I'll start with a confession that uh, I've been a little stressed this morning. I had a handout that I intended to give to you as you came in. Uh, we are down a printer, apparently, in the office, so that did not get uh, handoutable because uh, I couldn't print it. Uh, it turns out that having a printer is a necessary condition. Uh, Deshaun's volunteering to print it, but I don't even have the original copy at this point. I was going to print the original. So my solution was to post it online. Um, so, if you uh, have your device, uh, you may want to go to our homepage, and on our homepage, uh, you'll find the link for Adult Sunday School. And on that Adult Sunday School uh, link, you may need to refresh your page so that it's not using the previously cached version, uh, but there will be a handout uh, for March 28th which I think is still today, right? Um, stress does strange things to my brain and the calendar uh, sometimes. So, so that's a, a housekeeping note. That's the handout for this morning. Just because there are a bunch of things that we'll be using, it may be helpful for you to have those as a source of reference. Well, my name's Brian, um, and this spring we are looking at the doctrines of grace as a primer for Reformed theology. And so we began in week one uh, thinking about, and if you look really closely at the board, I just erased it here, thinking about uh, what is Reformed theology, right? That we all have a theology, that we've been doing theology uh, interpersonally, historically, intergenerationally over time, and that, that theology is passed down to us via traditions. <clears throat> and those traditions get passed via catechisms and confessions. And so we're thinking together about how, do, how does our theology become the most biblical theology that we could have uh, out there. And I defined Reformed theology as God saves sinners. Just three words, God saves sinners. And then in week two, um, Bentley was here, and Bentley talked a little bit about sola gratia, that salvation, justification, is by grace alone. It's not by our merits or our works. And he talked a little bit about the historical context of that, and then the biblical context of that, and the personal context of that. Uh, and he said that grace will take us all the way home. That salvation is about grace from beginning to end. And isn't that good news for us this morning? Uh, and then uh, last week, Patrick Connolly uh, talked a little bit about union with Christ, solus Christus. As we start, we're walking through the five solas of the Reformation uh, here. And so, uh, Patrick did solus Christus, that our salvation is in Christ alone. In Christ alone. That every, all the benefits that we get come from being united to Christ. And you see that, in, for example, in Ephesians 1, 3-14, through 14, this run-on sentence that Paul has. It's just one sentence in the Greek, and you see, in Christ over and over again. And so, when we think about union with Christ, uh, we think about salvation from beginning to end, all being undergirded with union with Christ. So, you have uh, from predestination to election to effectual calling <clears throat> to regeneration to conversion, which is faith and repentance, to justification, adoption, sanctification, preservation, and finally glorification. All of that comes because we're united to Christ. And then today, uh, we're going to talk about sola fide, faith alone. Faith alone as the instrument 
of our salvation. Uh, But as we uh, come to that this morning, would you stop and pray with me for our time? Heavenly Father, what good news it is that our salvation has been accomplished for us. That in Christ, everything that we need for salvation has been accomplished. That Jesus did everything. Father, would that in this hour transform our hearts and our minds and our lives, that we are living not for justification, for acceptance, but living from justification and from our acceptance. Father, as we ponder these things together, I pray that you would convince us of our sin and misery, that you would enlighten our minds in the knowledge of Christ, and that you would renew our wills by the power of the gospel, the work of your Holy Spirit, and the mediation of your Son. I ask that you would forgive the one who teaches his sins, for they are many. May we see Jesus in him only. Amen. So, Martin Luther famously said, right, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of Wittenberg, October 31st, 1517, and he started the Reformation. And Martin Luther famously said, justification is the article upon which the church stands or falls. Justification. So the question is, what is justification? If this is the one thing upon which the church stands or falls, it would be rather important for us to know, wow, did you then print it out? And let's give Deshaun a a round of applause here. Thank you, Deshaun. (laughs) Um, So we've got our handouts here. Um, Justification is the article upon which the church stands or falls. So the question is, what is justification? And uh, throughout the history of the church, justification has been agreed upon. Now, in recent days, with the new perspective on Paul, what is justification uh, has come into question uh, a little bit. Uh, But justification throughout the history of the church has been defined as God declaring sinners righteous. God declaring sinners righteous. And this is a forensic act or, or a judicial act. I know that we've got some lawyers in here. This is the, the judge in the courtroom banging the gavel and saying, this man is innocent. He's free of all charges. He's free to go, right? It's a forensic act that God declares sinners righteous. <clears throat> now, this term justification is used in the New Testament. Um, It's used specifically, now you'll find it in a couple of different places, but you'll find concentrations of this word justification or to justify. Uh, Specifically, any thoughts? Where where do you you see justification most in the New Testament? Yep, Romans. And then there's one other spot. Galatians, okay? Romans and Galatians. It appears 14 times in the verbal form in Romans, two times in the noun form, and then it appears six times in Galatians in the verbal form to justify. And then it appears three times in the book of James. And we'll get to that dialogue later. Uh, So, to justify. And so, the question of the Reformation is how are we justified? How are we justified? What's the basis of our justification. And uh, the Roman Catholic Church, hmm, yeah, I'm going to do it like this. The Roman Catholic Church, and by the way, let, let me just do a, a brief pause here. Um, caveat. Uh, R.C. Sproul's Grace Unknown, The Heart of Reformed Theology, is a really excellent summary of the five solas and then the five points of Calvinism. Uh, I, I went. I, I was so enamored by this book as I was 
reading it again to talk to a couple about what is Reformed theology, and that I was like, you know what, I'm just going to buy it for them. And then I realized that it was out of print, and so it cost like $42 instead of your typical $15. And I was like, eh, I can summarize it pretty well. Um, but but it's, it's a fantastic book. I'm leaning on it heavily. Uh, R.C. Sproul did a great job of popularizing the Reformed tradition and making it very accessible to folks who um, are the average folk in the pew that way. So the Roman Catholic Church would say that grace, faith, and Christ are necessary conditions for salvation, for justification. Necessary conditions. Grace, faith, and Christ are necessary conditions for our salvation, for our justification. Um, But there's a difference between a necessary condition and a sufficient condition. Okay? And I I was thinking about this the other night, uh, Friday night, as I was mowing all of our weeds. Um, We like to call it a lawn, but there are really a lot of weeds there and we'd been gone and so it hadn't been mowed yet and I'm mowing the lawn in my creative brain I said okay well how do we think about necessary versus sufficient conditions and I realized oh yeah well it's necessary in order to mow your lawn to have a lawn mower right that's a necessary condition now then I started arguing with myself yeah but there was that summer when you were five when you were out in California in Palo Alto where, you know, you really could have cut the lawn with scissors because the lawn was so small, right? But okay, let, let's just say that it's a necessary, you, you need, there needs to be a lawnmower involved in order to mow the lawn, right? It's a necessary condition. But does having a lawnmower mean that your lawn is mowed? Does your neighbor having a lawnmower mean that the lawn is mowed? No, it's a necessary condition, but it's not what? It's not a sufficient condition because the lawn is not mowed until I get out there and spend an hour walking behind the self-propelled and, you know, making sure that all of the high weeds got cut down, right? Um, It's not a sufficient condition until someone actually uses the lawnmower to mow the lawn. So, the Roman Catholic Church says grace, faith, and Christ are necessary conditions— but they don't say that they're sufficient conditions. So when it comes to Christ, we're really talking about Christ's righteousness. And the Catholic Church would say that Christ's righteousness is infused by baptism. It's infused by baptism baptism. And uh, we'll we'll get to the Reformed view in a minute, but it's infused by baptism. So think about what what is infusion? Uh, Infusion is when something is put into or added, right? If if you get a blood infusion, is that the technical, is it a transfusion? Barrett, help me out here. Um, If you get an infusion of blood, right, it's something that's put into your system. It becomes a part of you, okay? And that's what Uh, That's what they're saying with Christ's righteousness is it's infused, and the instrument of that is baptism. Baptism is the instrument through which Christ's righteousness is infused. Now, what's an instrument? Um, Well, think about uh, a, a sculptor and a block of stone, right? For that block of stone to become a sculpture... The sculptor needs to take what? A chisel, a hammer, right? And by using that chisel and that hammer, he's going to craft the sculpture out of that block of stone, right? The instrument is the chisel and the hammer. That's the instrumental cause of that block of stone becoming a sculpture, So baptism, they would say, is the instrument through which Christ's righteousness is infused to us. And so the way that happens as they talk about this is 
at your baptism, the Catholic Church would say that the state of original sin is reversed and you enter into a state of grace. You enter into a state of grace. Now, with that state of grace and with Christ's righteousness infused into you, you now need to cooperate with Christ's righteousness in you uh, so that Christ's righteousness in you in this state of grace becomes real righteousness. That is, it becomes inherent in you. And on the basis of your righteousness, right? Now, you couldn't, I understand, you couldn't have gotten to that state of righteousness apart from Christ's righteousness being infused into you, right? And taking, paying the penalty for original sin. But now it's what? It's up to you. you you've got to do the work. And on the basis of that, of you cooperating with that righteousness that's been infused to you, that righteousness becomes real for you, it becomes inherent, and on the basis of your righteousness, God what? God declares you to be righteous, because that righteousness is inherent in you. This is the Catholic view. I, I, I love it when uh, you know, people could be joining us midway through and be like, oh, is that what we believe? No, 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 this is, this is, the, Catholic, this is the Catholic view. So then when we think about grace in the Catholic view, again, grace is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient, so you need grace plus, and what the Catholics call it is congruous, congruous merit. Now, the Catholics have three kinds of merit. Uh, there's strict merit where the, the reward is necessarily owed. There's uh, condign merit where uh, that, uh, that reward should be given. And then there's congruous merit, which is kind of the reward is given because of the kindness and goodness of the person giving the reward. Um, and by the way, as we talk about the Catholic tradition here, this is a caricature, right? We're just trying to do the best that we can do to represent them, but it's a lot deeper and more nuanced than this. But just to, uh, to highlight pieces so that you can see where we're different. So you need grace. It's a necessary condition, but it's not enough, right? You need grace and you need congruous merit. You need faith, right? Faith is a necessary condition, but it's not what? It's not sufficient, right? So you need faith plus works. Okay, so this is the Catholic view. You need grace, faith, and Christ, but it's not enough. It's not sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Does that make sense? You all with me here? Okay, so... Um, in the Reformed view, ooh, I can even change colors here. In the Reformed view, grace, faith, and Christ are what? They're sufficient conditions. They're sufficient conditions, okay? That is, the lawn is already mowed. You, you need air to breathe. Air is a necessary condition, but it is not a sufficient condition to get oxygen into your body, right? There's something that needs to happen in the lungs when you breathe the air in that transfers the oxygen out of the air into, through the whatever it is, into your capillaries, into your bloodstream, right? That's, that is the way that works. Yeah, okay. Good. Um, so it's a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. Okay, so when we think about Christ's righteousness, instead of being infused, right, being put into <clears throat> your bloodstream that way, it's imputed. It's imputed. That is, it's counted as, it's credited to, right? Um, in Romans 4, it says that, 
Abraham believed God, and it was what? Credited to him as righteousness, right? So we're talking about the doctrine of imputation here, that Christ's righteousness is imputed to your account. Now, in the Reformed tradition, I'm rapidly going to run out of room here, um, in the Reformed tradition, we think about the doctrine of double imputation. So here's the sinner, and here's Jesus, okay? And this is your legal account. And the sinner, on his legal account initially, is sin, right? And on Jesus' legal account, because he earned salvation, uh, he earned eternal life, he earned the kingdom of heaven through his righteousness, <clears throat> you have righteousness on Jesus' account and sin on our account. And God, as the judge, through the doctrine of double imputation, Christ's righteousness is credited to our account. But what's the double part of this? The double part of this is that our sin is credited to Jesus' account. And so now, when God looks at the sinner, what? He sees righteousness. But when he looks at Jesus, what? He sees sin. And so Jesus has to die on the cross in order to pay the penalty for uh, our sin. And we uh, have Christ's righteousness credited to our account. And so what this means is uh, Luther could say in the Latin phrase uh, that we are simul justus et peccator, meaning we are simultaneously just and a sinner, right? So it's not that it's based on your righteousness, that you become so righteous that God has to declare you righteous. It's that you're still sinning, you're still a sinner, sin, now, and then there's sin, sin is no longer dominating your life, it's no longer ruling your life, but there's still remaining sin in your life, um, and so you're still a sinner, right? But God by grace, through imputation, through the imputation of Christ's righteousness, right, declares you just. Now, what's the vehicle, what's the instrument of that imputation? Remember, the, the Catholic Church says Christ's righteousness is infused by baptism. The Reformed tradition says Christ's righteousness is imputed what? By faith by faith. That faith is the vehicle through which Christ's righteousness is imputed to our account. So faith, then, is a sufficient condition for our justification, because faith, as the vehicle to connect us to Christ's righteousness, uh, is enough right? For Christ's righteousness to be imputed to us. Um, so, when we say just, and this is directly from Sproul here, justification by faith alone is merely shorthand for justification by the righteousness of Christ alone. His merit, and only his merit, is sufficient to satisfy the demands of God's justice. It is precisely this merit that is given to us by faith. Christ is our righteousness. So imputation by faith. Christ's righteousness is imputed to us by faith. That's a pretty radical difference between the two, right? Is it infused so that we're declared righteous based on our own righteousness, or is Christ's righteousness imputed to us, and we're declared righteous on the basis of Christ's righteousness. Now think about the Old Testament, right? In the Old Testament, there are images over and over again, not of infused righteousness, but of imputed righteousness, right? So in Leviticus chapter 4, where there's the sin offering, and 
depending on uh, your economic scale, you had to purchase different pieces, uh, different animals, and sacrifice them, right? Was that saying that you were paying for your own sins somehow? No, it's saying that this, and by the way, it's really interesting. In Leviticus chapter 4, this word unintentionally pops up again and again. Those sin offerings are for unintentional sins, which begs the question, what? What about those intentional sins, right? Um, so, so there's this idea of something needs to die in my place to pay the penalty for my sins. Or in Leviticus 16, you get this beautiful picture, right, of the scapegoat. You remember what happens for the scapegoat? The, the high priest uh, does all these things where he sheds blood uh, for his own sins, he sheds blood for the sins of the place, right? The sins of the temple. But then for the sins of the people, what does he do? He takes his hands and he puts them on the head of that scapegoat and he imputes the sins of the people. By the way, the sin offerings was for unintentional sins. Now he's imputing the sins of the people onto the scapegoat. Intentional sins, right? Right? And he sends that scapegoat out into the wilderness. And do you know where Jesus dies? He dies in the wilderness, right? Because Jesus, and, and this, is, uh, this is Romans chapter 3, right? Where you have, uh, th- th- so that God could be righteous and bo- both just and the justifier of sinners. God has waited all this time and now all of those sins year after year have been put off out into this, on the scapegoat, transferred, imputed onto the scapegoat, out into the wilderness. Now, God finally deals with those sins as they're imputed to Jesus on the cross. So this idea of imputation is all throughout the Old Testament. So, instead of an inherent righteousness that justifies us, the Reformers would say, It's an alien righteousness, and this isn't like Sigourney Weaver kind of stuff. This is something that's outside of us. It's not inherent to us. It's a righteousness that comes from outside of us. It's an alien righteousness, and because it's a sufficient condition, it's Christ's righteousness alone, right? The the whole yard is mowed. So, the Catholic position would say that faith, wow, that's really bad, that faith plus works equals justification, okay? But the Reformed tradition would say that faith equals justification plus works. And by the way, the antinomian position uh, would say that justification equals faith minus works. But that's a whole other discussion. Uh, So, faith equals justification plus works. That's the reformed tradition. That's the reformed tradition. The Catholic tradition is saying faith plus works equals justification. Now, since you have your handout, uh, the first scripture there says, uh, and th- this is what, as the reformers are saying, hey guys, it's justification by faith alone, the Catholics would have responded with James 2.24, you see that a person is justified by works, and not by faith alone. And you see the Catholics, you know, kind of drop the mic at this point. We've got, it says it right there, right? It's in Scripture. It's not, it's, it's not by faith alone, right? Justification is by works. A person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And then the Reformers could have responded with lots of different Scriptures, but I've, I've put Galatians 2, 16, here, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. 
So, so we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Now, some folks out there will go, yeah, see, Scripture can't be inerrant. I mean, it contradicts itself here, right? At one place, it says it's not by works, it's by faith alone. The other place, it says it's not by faith, it's by works. So Scripture contradicts itself, right? No. <laughs> I'm not saying any heads nod. No, Scripture does. So, so, so how, how do you put those two things together? How, how, do they, how do you hold those two things together? Say again? There, okay, he doesn't specify whose works. That's good. Um, and, and that's the ultimate answer, right? Because we are saved by works. I, I once wrote an article uh, for, the, it was then called the Reformed Quarterly, uh, called Justification by Works. And the whole point was it's justification is by the work of Christ. But the, the, ar- the title of the article they had to change. They were too uncomfortable. Uh, th- thought I was heter- heterodox. Um, there. Yes, it is justification by works. It's justification by the works of Christ. But, but what resolves it here is what, ja- and I've got it in the next scripture there, James 2.14. What is James talking about? He's talking about what is the nature of saving faith. So look at James 2.14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? So we're talking about what is the nature of saving faith. And you see, in the Reformed tradition, we would agree that it's not merely the profession of faith. Right? If, you, if, you prayed, if someone prays the sinner's prayer, and they prayed that 10 years ago, that's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. Right? It's not just, well, I prayed that prayer, so I'm good. No, what, what's supposed to happen? True faith, real faith, living faith, saving faith is going to what? Is necessarily going to have works. That's why the Reformed tradition, we say faith equals justification plus works. Now, those works are in no way meritorious, not even congruous merit, right? They're in, they don't earn your salvation one bit, okay? But they, they give credence to the fact that your faith is a real faith. It's a true faith. It's a living faith. It's a saving faith. Just saying some words. Like, it's not like you need a, a magical rabbit's foot, right? That, uh, okay, I just, I'm just going to rub the rabbit's foot because I said this, and so I'm... No, you need a real, legitimate, saving faith that way. So justification is by faith alone, the reformers would say, but not by faith that is alone. Let me say that again. Justification is by faith alone, but not by faith that is alone. So our sanctification begins the moment we're justified. Now, um, one of the beautiful things here, uh, John Murray wrote a book in the, ooh, Uh, late 70s, um, that's really helpful. It's called Redemption Accomplished and Applied. And uh, here, when we think about redemption accomplished, this is redemption accomplished right here. Jesus does everything that we need, right, in order to be saved. Redemption is accomplished. And how is it applied? By the Holy Spirit, through grace and through faith, uh, with faith being the vehicle grace being the supplier, the Holy Spirit applies that salvation to us, right? So in the Reformed tradition, we see this distinction between redemption accomplished and redemption applied, but what happens in the Catholic tradition? Guess what? You're still, what? Accomplishing your salvation with each good work that you do, and you better not commit a mortal sin, because if you commit a mortal sin, then you will undo that state of grace that you had through your baptism that way. So, in some ways, right, the Catholic Church is confusing justification 
and sanctification. They're saying, based on your growing holiness, God is going to declare you just. <clears throat> so look then in your handout, thank you, Deshaun, uh, to Westminster Confession question 33. That whole series of questions is incredibly helpful <clears throat> here as we think about um, God's saving act and redemption accomplished and applied here. But what is justification? Justification is an act, it's a one-time act of God's free grace wherein he pardons, I'm not with the ETHs here, he pardons, it was written in 1646, you know, King James English, 1607, that's why you get the ETHs. Uh, we, we can modernize it a little bit. He pardons, wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Now, in this context, you hear, you hear that, right? It's an act of God's free grace where he pardons our sins, accepts us as righteous only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. And you can hear all of the argument in the background, right? Is it infused by baptism? No, it's imputed by faith. Is it an inherent righteousness? No, it's an alien. You can hear all of that baggage imported here. Uh, and then you have sanctification. San what is sanctification? Sanctification is the work of God's free grace. This is question 35. Whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die to sin and live to righteousness, right? Part of these works are that we're becoming more and more like the image of Jesus that way. So then the New City Catechism uh, summarizes it together in, and this is 2017, uh, summarizes it together with Tim Keller um, in one question. What do justification and sanctification mean? Justification means our declared righteousness before God made possible by Christ's death and resurrection for us. Sanctification means our gradual growing righteousness made possible by the Spirit's work in us. So at some level, this discussion between the Catholic view and the Reformed view comes down to a difference between justification and sanctification. The Catholic view wants to incorporate sanctification into your justification. So really the question is, does sanctification result from justification? Or does sanctification result in justification? Let me say that again. Does sanctification result from justification, right? So we're justified, and then our sanctification flows out of that. Then our righteousness, our holiness comes as a part of being justified, or does our sanctification result in our justification? All those works that you do now are a part of your justification. And can I say, I mean, th think about that for a minute. That makes all the difference in the world in the Christian life. Are you living the Christian life because you have been justified and therefore you're living from acceptance? You're living from security. You're living from love. You're living from justification. Or are you living for security? Are you living for love? Are you living for acceptance? Right? Uh, the, uh, th this takes me back to uh, the movie with uh, Chariots of Fire with Harold Abrams and Eric Little, right? And what does Eric Little say? When I run, I feel his pleasure, right? There's just this delight. And, and what does Harold Abrams say? You know, 
when the gun goes off, I have 10 seconds to justify, he uses the language, to justify my existence, right? He says, if I can't win, I won't run. To which his fiance says, if you don't run, you can't win, right? It makes all the, so now think about this because sometimes our personal experience feels a lot like this, right? I've got to do, I've got to achieve, I've got to be, I've got to accomplish, uh, especially if you're like me, you like to check boxes, right? You, I can justify myself on how many boxes I checked for Jesus today. Or are we just living out of the sheer joy of being adopted as a child of God? You have everything that you need so you can live. And, and, and by the way, that from for distinction changes your relationships. It changes your relationship with yourself. It changes the way you live life, right? If you need love, if you, if you go to your spouse or to another person and you need love, you're going to love them very differently than if you go to them being full, knowing that you're fully loved and you're free to give, right? You guys know about this difference in love. You've felt this, right? You've experienced this, right? Okay. Com- complete all the difference in the world there. And the good news of the gospel, I think, is the Reformed view, right? And by the way, we can add grace alone and faith alone here. The good news of the gospel is you don't have to keep working. You don't have to keep pedaling. You don't have to keep accomplishing, achieving. Why? Because all that you need for salvation has already been done for you. It's already been done Well, but Brian, doesn't that mean some people are going to go out and live, you know, these crazy, audacious lives, sinning all over the place? Well, that's always the fear, right, in the Reformation. Uh, Steve Brown once said, if you're not, if you're preaching the gospel and people don't get to an antinomian kind of a place, like where they're, you might not be preaching the gospel hard enough. But but remember, right, that faith, it's not faith, this is the antinomian position, justification equals faith minus works. No, 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 no. We're going to see those works, but those works don't justify you in any way. Okay. Ooh, can we get it in? I think so. So then that, the question that needs to be answered, that we've not answered this whole time, is what is faith? What is faith, right? Uh, Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 86. You'll see this on your handout. Again, thanks to Sean. Uh, What is faith in Jesus Christ? Faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he has offered to us in the gospel. It's a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he's offered to us in the gospel. You know, spell check is so handy, it doesn't come on the whiteboard, however. Uh, knowledge, conviction, trust. These are considered the three aspects, the three parts of faith. Knowledge, conviction, and trust. Uh, noticia, ascensus, and fiducia in Latin knowledge is that there is a a body of knowledge, right? There are certain things that you need to believe in order for it to be saving faith. You can't just believe that the sky is blue. I mean, you can believe that the sky is blue, but believing that the sky is blue is not going to save you. Believing that Zion Williamson is the second best player in the NBA is not going to save you. You can have all sorts of beliefs, but there is a certain set of things that you need to believe in order to be saved. And what are the, so, nope, don't have time for that. Um, So, uh, what is that? Well, uh, New New City Catechism, uh, again, refer to your handout here. Question 31 says, what, what do we believe by true faith? Everything taught to us in the gospel, the Apostles' Creed expresses what we believe in these words. So, the New City Catechism is saying saving faith consists of a body of knowledge that is assenting to the Apostles' Creed. Here's a set of things that you need to believe in order to 
be saved. Then there's conviction. Conviction. Um, so it's not just having the data, right? Having the content. You must also mentally assent to the truth of this information. You have to say, yeah, there's these things, and I believe them, but I believe them to be true. You can't reject the truth claims of the gospel and still be justified. So, so you need to have the proper uh, set of beliefs, which are really minimal. Uh, sometimes we like to, we, want, we try to expand those in the way we live our lives, and we don't need to do that. So, saving faith is really simple. Uh, apostles, creed, like basics. And then you have conviction is mental assent. And again, knowledge and conviction are necessary conditions for faith, but they're not what? They're not sufficient conditions for faith because you know who has knowledge and conviction? The devil. He, he knows the truth and he believes it to be true. So you need a third part, and that third part is trust, right? That's personal trust and reliance on Christ and on Him alone for your justification. That's a personal reliance, right? So you're receiving and resting in Christ alone for your salvation, okay? And so these are the three aspects of faith, knowledge, conviction, right? A body of knowledge, belief that that's true, and then trusting in it. That is the vehicle, right? Um, <clears throat> as a way of sharing his faith years ago, it was the early 1900s. Um, I don't remember the guy's name off the cuff. Um, there was somebody who at Niagara Falls strung a rope across Niagara Falls, right? And uh, he, he took sandbags, put them into a wheelbarrow, and walked the wheelbarrow across, across Niagara Falls, right? Across this rope. And he gets to the other side, everybody's amazed and awed, and <clears throat> how many of you think I can do it again, right? How many of you really believe, you, you've seen it, right? You know that I can do it, and, and you believe it. I, I believe you. What? Who wants to get in the wheelbarrow? right? That's that third part. That's trust, okay? Are you in the wheelbarrow uh, that way? So three parts, okay? Knowledge, conviction, trust. But then we need to ask this question. Where does saving faith come from? Where does saving faith come from? It's very popular out there in the, the semi-Pelagian world, um, you know, uh, where you'll find uh, some of our uh, godly denominations uh, to say that faith is up to us. You better believe, right, this goes back to 1740 and the Great Awakening and James Finney and the ancient bench where he would get a group of people on the bench and he would say, I'm not letting you go until you profess faith in Christ, right? That, that you have to believe, okay? <clears throat> but I would say that if your faith is up to you, then what separates those who are in heaven from those who are in hell. It's their faith. And who is responsible for their faith? They were. And if they're responsible for their faith, then what? Then it's justification by works. John 6, 29, Jesus says, this is the work of the Father, to believe in the one whom he has sent, that faith is a work. So if what separates those who go, go to heaven from those who go to hell is, work, is this work of faith, the question is, where does that faith come from? And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves. Neither grace nor faith are of yourself. It is what? The gift of God. It's the, so this is something that God, God gives you faith. So it's not that faith 
precedes regeneration, 